How can we disagree without killing each other? That's the question Andy Bannister has for us today. But does he have a decent answer? Oh, wait, come on. This is Andy Bannister we're talking about here. Of course he doesn't. So let's go watch him fail. Andy Bannister has drug his nose out of his Bible long enough to notice that the world is a mess, full of violence based on ideological differences, and, although he won't admit it, overly emotional reactions to real-world issues. He thinks he has an answer, but, as usual, he only shows that he has no idea what the question is. Now, this is hardly a surprise, because, from Andy's perspective, Nothing he says makes a lick of sense, and if he had the capacity to step back, even for a moment, and examine his ideas rationally, he'd never have made this or any of his other laughable videos at all. Blind ignorance and bald rationalizations with no sense whatsoever are the hallmarks of the religious zealot. So here we go again. How can we disagree without killing one another? That's a good question for the religious, because the religious are among the only ones really guilty of this. History is replete with examples of religious wars and conflicts where one religion will go after another religion and make them very, very dead. What? You don't believe in my imaginary friend? Heretic! Die! It's what happens when you allow irrationality to rule your life. The fact that this happens is a pretty good reason to reject religiosity altogether. But let's see what Andy thinks. You know, that's a question that I find myself asking on a near daily basis as I turn on the news, read the newspaper and see yet more examples of society becoming ever more divided. Uh, whether it's some of the uh, burning questions about sexuality or about politics that seem to be dividing our culture in two, it seems that we've forgotten as a culture how we can profoundly disagree with each other yet still live together civilly our society. But see, here's the thing. Those are significant and worthwhile questions to ask, but where people tend to disagree, especially vehemently disagree, those are places where feelings get involved over facts. It's where people's wishful thinking means more to them than the evidence does, more than rational thoughts, more than pretty much anything else in their lives. The more emotional the response, the less rational it happens to be. It's a rationality that separates society. And guess which side you're on, Andy? You know, I think this problem began uh, very much online uh, with social media, media enabling us to divide into tribes uh, aligned around our particular interests and, of course, hurl insults at the other side. And now it's spreading uh, from online to the offline world with people rioting and people marching and insulting the other sides and even physical violence uh, now happening. People have even died uh, in, recent, uh, in recent news around the world because of their political beliefs or their religious allegiances as they're attacked by people who profoundly disagree with them. That's been going on for as long as humanity has existed. Your own Bible provides copious examples of times when you think your God told the Hebrews to go out and slaughter the infidels, down to the very last infant and goat, because they weren't kissing the right God's ass. This is nothing new. We just have the ability today to disagree with a much broader range of people People you don't actually have to be standing in front of, and that's what's made things much worse. You used to have to face down those you disagreed with face to face. Now you can do it anonymously online. And I'll tell you, Andy, some of the most hate-filled people that I have ever seen in my life, they tend to come from the religious community. We're not just talking about trolls. I mean, people who legitimately think that anyone who doesn't bow down and grovel at the feet of their imaginary friend, those people need to die. 
It's why the vast majority of terrorist attacks out there are performed in the name of religion. You don't see an awful lot of atheists out there blowing up mosques and churches. You do see Christians and Muslims doing it, though. I wonder why. How have we got here? And how do we put the problem back together again? How can we find a way to, uh, to disagree without killing each other? We have to promote rational thinking in all things, including and perhaps especially in religion. We need to get emotions out of the picture, and that's something that you and the rest of the religious cabal will never do, because without emotions, you've got nothing. Religion cannot exist without irrationality. It is blind beliefs based on feelings, often to the utter exclusion of any kind of evidence or intellectual integrity. You can't survive without raw emotion, and raw emotions, unmoderated by intellect and critical thinking, far too often they lead to violence. You're kind of stuck here, Andy. Well, as a Christian, it would come as no surprise uh, for you to hear me say that I think the most profound model, and I think our society is looking for models that can solve this problem, uh, can be found in the person of Jesus. Yeah, I kind of figured you'd say something like that, but you're wrong. Your model, first off, isn't real. There's no reason to think that Jesus ever existed in the first place. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use an imaginary figure as a model, because Certainly you can, but if you're going to use a make-believe Jesus as your goal, you at least have to make sure it's realistic. And surprise, surprise, it isn't. This is just more emotional wishful thinking from one of the religions that is causing most of the damage worldwide. Go figure. Firstly, of course, Jesus was one uh, to whom violence was done, but who didn't respond violently. You know, his enemies who hated what he said, who, uh, who heaped insults and then violence, and then finally ended up nailing him to a cross and killing him. He didn't respond uh, with hatred, he didn't respond with violence, but he responded by saying, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Not while he was here, at least according to your myths. Of course, Jesus is also part of the Godhead, and God is well known for responding violently to just about everything in the Old Testament. God is the one who set up the system that if you don't kiss his ass, he'll fry you in a lake of fire for all time. So I don't think you're going to get very far claiming this imaginary friend of yours is a good model to follow. And even as he hung there on a Roman cross, dying on that, uh, on that Judean hillside, he said from the cross, Father, forgive them, he prayed. They don't know what they do. Profound message of how to respond even to hatred uh, with nonviolence. I think we're looking for models like that in our culture. And that didn't last very long, because the second the early church got political power, they went around and started killing all the heretics in the name of their imaginary friend. Now, sure, idealistically, turning the other cheek is a great image to hold to, but it doesn't actually work in the real world. Refusing to fight back just means that everyone else is going to see you as an easy target and go after you harder until either you're dead or, at the very least, until you've got nothing more that anyone wants to take from you. It doesn't stop violence unless everyone adopts that ideal. Good luck on that. But more profoundly than that, becoming a Christian and becoming a follower of Jesus doesn't merely mean looking at him and his, his example and thinking, wow, I need to be like that. But actually the message of the New Testament is that God loves us so much. He came into space and time and history in the person of Jesus, died there on the cross on my behalf and your behalf in order to deal with the mess and brokenness and bigotry and, and hatred and, and judgmentalism in all of our hearts. And that when we put our faith in Christ, he begins putting us back together again and quite literally giving us a new identity. But that's where the whole idea is unrealistic, because that's not how humans work. I mean, if every single Christian adopted that model and refused to fight back no matter what happened, you'd wind up with Christianity getting largely wiped out by other religions who don't hold to that ideal. And I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, just that it's a realistic one. 
so long as you have one group of people holding ideas that cannot be demonstrated and thinking that another group of people who hold ideas that also can't be demonstrated are heretics, you are going to have violence. And yes, this goes for politics too. And the exciting thing about that is because as a Christian, if you've taken Jesus' message seriously, your identity is now based in Jesus and not on your beliefs, you know, political or otherwise. Now you can listen to those who disagree with you. You don't have to get angry because someone disagrees with you because my identity is not formed in being right. My identity is based on Jesus and what he's done for me and the fact that I've been adopted into God's family because of Jesus' transforming work on the cross. Yeah, except all of the hatred and bigotry and all the other things that Andy mentioned, all of that is ultimately God's fault to begin with. God made us this way. God knew full well what we'd do if he followed through with his plan, and he did it anyhow. God didn't send Jesus down thinking, wow, you know, maybe I ought to drop the needle on the anger gauge a couple of points. He sent his son to die, a human sacrifice to God's own ego, and then nothing changed. Humans are still humans, and sins aren't really forgiven. It was a publicity stunt that ultimately solved nothing. And for some reason, some reason I can't understand, you're proud of it. And that means I can embrace those, I can befriend those who think differently. Yeah, how's that working out for you? Because Christians don't fare too well in modern society. If we look at prison entry statistics, that's entry statistics, not polls conducted among the already incarcerated, we find that the religious are far, far overrepresented in prisons compared to their outside numbers in society. Atheists, on the other hand, are absurdly underrepresented. We make up 0.2% of the prison population according to the latest statistics I could find. The religious aren't doing well. You only have to look at the ongoing sex scandals in the Catholic Church and in other Christian denominations to see that. Being a Christian doesn't make you more moral. I'd say it makes you less so. That's a powerful, powerful basis for engaging those who disagree with you. Except you really don't, or you wouldn't try to spend all of your time trying to change everyone around you. You can't say, I accept you, and then try to make them just like you are. That's not acceptance, that's hypocrisy. Christian acceptance led to things like, oh, I don't know, Giordano Bruno getting burned to death, and Galileo spending the rest of his life on house arrest because he thought things the church didn't like. That's not how acceptance works. But as I look at what Jesus did on the cross, something else occurs to me as well that's incredible. In terms of difference, you couldn't think of something more different than us as human beings in our state of rebellion against God, choosing in our natural state to go our own way, want our own way, want to turn our backs on God, to be rebels, to demand autonomy and want nothing to do with God. God could have turned around to us and gone, right, that's what you want, well, stuff you then, and wanted nothing to do with us and just uh, hurled abuse at us. Well, that's kind of how things worked out, though, isn't it? Because God didn't take any worthwhile actions to stop humans from doing all of those things. He had a purely symbolic act that ultimately changed nothing. In fact, it probably made things worse. When you believe, truly believe, that all of your sins are forgiven, even though demonstrably they're not, but when you believe that you just have to ask for forgiveness and you have this magic get out of sin free card, it takes whatever control your religion has and throws it right out the window. I was looking at a case yesterday where a Christian man in Massachusetts kidnapped a woman, then raped her repeatedly and made her read the Bible between the rapes because, you know, it must have been her fault and she needs forgiveness. How did God fix any of this? He didn't. He just took away accountability. But God didn't. He looked at us with our difference and our alienation and our rebellion, and he decided nevertheless that he would come in the person of Jesus and lay down his life, give his very life for us in order to bring us back into reconciliation with him. Yeah, except clearly it didn't do that, did it? 
because I shouldn't be able to find case after case after case after case of religious people murdering, raping, torturing, and abusing others in the name of their religion if somehow Jesus brought everyone back into line with God's wishes. So that just didn't happen. What other excuses can you come up with, Andy? The Bible in Romans 5 verse 8 says God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, aliens, rebels, people who wanted nothing to do with him, Jesus Christ died for us. What a tremendous demonstration of how to love people even when they are radically different. What an amazing rationalization, taking what you really wish was true and ignoring what is demonstrably true in the real world. This is kind of how the religious operate though, isn't it? Find a problem, twist and turn their already existing beliefs so that they can be made to apply to whatever the problem is, and hope nobody looks too hard at the asinine contortions that they've been through. Anyone who's familiar with the Bible and the history of Christianity is going to look at Andy's claims and laugh at this nonsense. It literally makes no sense whatsoever. God, the all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing creator of everything, takes the simplest path conceivable, doesn't actually solve any problems, and then doesn't take any responsibility for causing the problems in the first place. And for some reason, we're supposed to be thankful and kiss his ass for essentially half-assing it. I'm not quite sure that's the message that Andy intends to send, but it is an accurate message. It is a true message. But Andy and his religious brethren, they're not honest or rational or intelligent enough to recognize it. Honestly, why am I not surprised?